so a little bit of introduction. Um, I want to say welcome everyone to today and a big welcome and thank you to Dana, Chris and Megan from the Centre of Independent Living uh, Northern Ireland for joining us today. The Centre for uh, Independent Living was set up in 2001 and is a user-led organisation. It is part of the worldwide independent living movement, which grew out of the US civil rights movement in the 60s. Across the world, uh, centres look at how societies could be better organised to ensure people with disabilities have equal access to services, facilities, jobs, a family life, etc., and set up services that help remove barriers that are limiting the control people have over their own lives. One of the keys identified to enabling maximum choice, flexibility and control was by accessing individualised support through employing personal assistance. The Centre of Independent Living Northern Ireland works in various ways to promote the principles of independent living, independent living both locally and internationally. In particular, they provide a range of services for people using or considering direct payments and personal assistance. Today's seminar relates specifically to that side of their work. Dina um, has worked in the voluntary and community centre, our sector, within the field of disability rights and services for over 35 years, working for the Centre of Independent Living NI for 14 years. She, is, she initially carried out research and development to help identify and address barriers to update to up to the uptake of direct payments within certain geographical areas and within mental health services. She then worked as an advisor before taking up her post as regional service manager, managing the independent living advice and advocacy service for three, three years ago. Chris has been working within the voluntary and community sector for 14 years. Seven of those years uh, for the Lilac Service, promoting the inclusion of children and young people with additional needs within, within mainstream schools. And for just over seven years now with the Centre of Independent Living as an independent living advisor. And last but not least, but the newest member of the team is Megan. Megan moved to Northern Ireland in 2019 and has recently started working for the Centre. She has a background in various different financial areas with 13 years of relative experience. She has project managed various community-based corporate charity events in South Africa. Thank you again, um, everyone, for joining us. And now I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to Chris. Uh, over to myself, I think, first. Uh, well, sorry, Chris, to bring it up. Sorry, Dana. Yes, yeah. it's over to you now. Okay. Just waiting on my sharing options coming up on my screen here. We practiced this yesterday and I can't get the controls up. So Chris, maybe you would just move us on there, please. Sorry, there's always going to be some technical difficulty, isn't there? I Wouldn't don't have seminar without it, Dana. <laughs> <laughs> is there is there someone there has control of the screen who could click on for me, please? Because I, I, I see I see a mouse, so Chris must be working. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, the, the, this session really um is 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 compacting training that, that normally uh, could cover up to two days, uh, uh two two full days. Uh, I've seen that happen within trust. So this this session, this uh, webinar is just going to be covering skimming over the top of a lot of things. We'll not be going into a huge amount of detail, um, but I'll be reminding you at the end. But I, I want to say at the outset, we are available to talk to individual teams about anything that we'll be covering today, um, brushing over the top of. Um, what we want to do is. Um, just briefly look at SDS direct payments and what's involved in supporting PA employers in particular um, and what you can do um, because as I'll be explaining we're a relatively small team and there is a really important role that you can play in supporting uh, DP SDS uh, users. Next slide please Chris. 
Okay, so our, our mission is uh, to empower disabled people to live independently in an inclusive society through delivering quality services and campaigning for change. And let's say that campaigning is not limited to Northern Ireland. We're involved in campaigns in other countries as well. Um, as a user-led organisation, um, what that means is we are, uh, to be on our board, to be one of our directors, you actually have to have a disability and have lived experience. Okay. Next slide, please, Chris. Um, our services can be summarised really in uh, over four uh, areas, the advice and support, um, the budgeting and our advocacy service. Those roles are all carried out within the advice, uh, across the advice team. Um, we've sort of separated payroll off to the side because that is a separate team and uh, we won't be going into detail about that today um, but should you want uh, more information on our payroll service at a later date we'd be happy to provide that and if again if you wanted even a short seminar or something on that we'd be happy to provide that. So who do we provide support for? Um, it's, it's basically for disabled people of all ages, physical disabilities, older people, uh, people with learning disabilities, mental health service users, children with disabilities. Our ultimate goal is to provide maximum choice and control for those individuals. However, about 80% of the people who we actually talk to on a day-to-day -day basis would tend to be family members or very close trusted friends um, who are acting on behalf of the individual, which is understandable, especially if you're, you're, you're talking about uh, children or maybe an older person who has last, lost some capacity. So quite often, as I say, we, we, it's actually the um, uh, family or, or friends of the actual service user who would be uh, contacting us. As advisors, uh, as a team, our, our goal is to make people aware, aware of what options are available to them um, so that they can make informed decisions about uh, the, the, the route that they take to accessing maximum choice and control over their lives, maximizing their, their independence. Uh, we advise on uh, in terms of managing employees how to be a good employer. We don't get involved in, in disputes or things like that because as you'll hear, hear soon that, that there are other there are other specialist organizations that we would refer on to. Um, but uh, we would help people to identify when they need to speak to a specialist. Um, many, many occasions there are, are simple solutions to some issues that people face. They just don't know what way to go about addressing them um, but as I say the more complex issues we pass on to the specialist organizations and um, we we make sure that people fully understand their role uh, whenever they become an employer some people approach us feeling it's it's like becoming a, it's like they're starting a business and we we reassure them that it's nothing as complex as that at all but there are responsibilities that come with it and it is really important because these um, uh, a lot of these responsibilities are actually tied in with legislation and to keep them um, within the law, they need to fulfill certain uh, um, uh, tasks and, and make sure that they keep up to date with, with uh, certain pieces of information. And we're available to help them with that, but ultimately it is their responsibility um, to, to, to keep on top of that and, and using organisations like ourselves uh, where, where need be. Um, we can also assess people who wish to use agencies um, by giving them advice on how to go about selecting an, an agency, what sort of questions to ask, what sort of contract that they should expect should they want, wish to use an agency, um, and uh, as I say, how they go about identifying those in, in, the, in their areas. Um, we also can give advice for those who are opting to use self-employed workers because that's quite different to um, becoming an employer. It's a, it's a completely different setup altogether. So we need to always make sure that people understand sort of what uh, their responsibilities are and what that worker's responsibility is um, and sort of le legally where they would stand in, in that sort of a scenario. 
Um, so in, in terms of the support that we provide, I would like you to keep in mind that while certainly through our payroll service, we are supporting about 2,500 to 3,000 service users across Northern Ireland. And lots of those would be in touch with our payroll service on a monthly basis and quite often have questions um, for, for ourselves as the advice team. And uh, we get lots of those qu queries coming in, in to us every day. Um, we um, have 10, this is what I'd like you to keep in mind, we have 10, the equivalent of 10 full-time staff uh, and the advice team and that's for all of Northern Ireland um, so you'll hopefully understand why we we see your involvement um, and uh, how essential it is that that you are kept well informed and um, so that you can support your 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 service users um, we assist with budgeting and finance we're going Megan will be covering that in, in her section um, and we also provide support to people so that um, they can self-advocate or if they they need some support uh, you, to gain information understand information um, or just having some difficulties or if relationships have broken down we can assist in, in an advocacy role um, and um, although in some cases, if it becomes quite a complex case, we would be referring on to another specialist agency. But certainly what we would refer to as low key advocacy, assisting people to get information, understand um, and, and clarify um, information is, is one, of the, one of the things that we would do as well. Um, and one of the ways that we would help people to self-advocate is through um, helping them to be clear about what it is that they, if they're approaching the trust uh, for whatever it might be, um, uh, that they're clear in explaining what it is that they that they need. That will ho hopefully also help yourselves. Um, and again, for those who, while we unfortunately we don't have capacity to help individuals from beginning to end with support, the, the support planning process, we can certainly um, guide and explain how to use different basic tools um, and how the whole process works. And um, we can we can assist them at various points throughout their support planning process. Um, but it's unfortunately we can't take on the role of, of, of assisting from beginning to end. Um, whenever, um, just another point about our payroll service, um, it is important that people know that while we offer a payroll service, um, using our, you don't need to use our payroll service in order to use the uh, advice and support service. Uh, it's, it's a separate uh, part of our organisation and people have a choice whether they use that or indeed some people may wish to do their, their, their own payroll or get a family member to do it or use another payroll service. Um, so that uh, just to make sure that people understand that that is just one option. When we explain that to service users, that you know you 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 can access the advice service uh, without being a payroll service user. Um, again, it's important to just be aware that we don't we used to receive funding from uh, three of the trusts, but now all of our funding comes directly from the Health and Social Care Board across all of uh, for all of Northern Ireland. So um, that that's that's how we are funded within the advice team. Okay, so if you want to move on there, please, Chris. Thank you. So our aims for our, our aims for this session um, is to increase uh, and refresh our knowledge of SDS and the role of the PA employer. Um, consider the essential role of support that support planning plays in putting disabled people in control and maximising personalisation increasing understanding of support available and the capacity of SIL, uh, the advice service, and how you can create a smoother experience for your trust service users. Okay, thank you, Chris. Just move on there. So hopefully all of you will be very familiar with uh, this branding, which is the self-directed support branding. 
um, and you will also hopefully have access to the service user guides and indeed your own practitioner guides. Um, if not, I'm sure your team lead uh, will be able to direct you to, to the, the, the full document. Um, it is based on self-directed support uh, is based on the direct payments legislation uh, of 2002. Um, it was it was designed in part in response to the the crisis in social care after the public um, the publication of Transforming Your Care, uh, or the Compton Review as it was sometimes known back in 2011. Um, as we all know, trans um, sorry the, the crisis in social care has continued on, but self directed support and um, working in partnership with service users and communities is seen as one of the key ways forward to um, addressing the needs that are out there, the social care needs that are out there in our, our community. As you know, there'll be have, there have been several other uh, reports and reviews uh, done since then, but it, they're all based on the same principles as TYC, Transforming Your Care. Um, the, the key principles um, are increasing advocacy. And as we see uh, that, that's mainly through good support planning to help service users to achieve the outcomes that they want. Um, giving service users greater control over how uh, they can use their personal budget or direct payment um, to best meet the outcomes that they have identified and getting their needs met. And it's also about building healthier partner, healthy partnerships between service users, trusts, unpaid support, and other voluntary and community organizations. Next slide, please, Chris. This is a, a flow chart that really does speak for itself and is, is, is fairly, um, is very, fairly straightforward. It is about, uh, obviously starts at the referral point and when you're assessing someone's need and it, uh, assessing if someone is eligible for support through, um, uh, through your, your trust. It's also about being very open and transparent and giving people information about what exactly it is they have uh, to work with, uh, both from the trust, but also helping them to identify what else is out there in the community as well. Then moving on to point five there, um, it is about building a support plan, putting the person who's in receipt of support in the driving seat to really uh, help them identify what are the outcomes that they wish to achieve and involving all parties in trying to achieve th those outcomes. I'll cover the four options in the ne next slide um, that can be used to achieve that. The support plan, as you know, then will need to be signed off by your, your team lead. And then there will be ongoing support likely needed at some point for that person to implement their plan. Some people may well just be able to go off and do it themselves, but some people may need your support. And then there's the usual monitoring and review. Next slide, please, Chris. Um, Originally, there were to be um, really the, the three options there, direct payments, managed budget and trust arranged support that was available through SDS. I do know that the managed budget um, option um, is, is still under development, um, but at the moment, certainly people can mix and match uh, both direct payments and trust arranged support. It's not one or the other. They can have a mixture of those. So moving on, please, Chris. And the trust resource allocation, just if we can reveal that magic number there, Chris, yeah, the 1291, does that, does the one size fits all? Um, well, I don't need to tell you that whenever you're assessing someone's needs, it can be quite diverse, each uh, trust service user's needs can be quite diverse. So it's been very difficult for the trust actually to identify how much do they allocate and the, currently they're using this figure of 1291, um, but it should be kept in mind while some PAs will uh, maybe be employed to address a so social isolation and those who have maybe been disconnected from their community and aiding them to um, 
interact more with their community and 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 develop more social contact other PAs will be required to carry out very highly skilled tasks, um, meeting some very complex needs. So please keep that in mind whenever you are looking at how much someone is going to require in order to get their, their needs net, met. And it should be looked at uh, very much on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so before I hand over, um, if we have time, I just wanted to check if you have any questions. I don't see anything there in the chat box, but if you want anything, if you want to ask me anything before we move on to Chris's section. Dina, can I ask the uh, 1291, is that 1291 per hour? For, for one member of staff, what if you require two members of staff? Sorry, yes, thanks for asking that, Mervyn. It's twelve ninety one per hour, and it is if if someone requires two staff, if it's by two, then it would be multiplied by two. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay, if if we have no other questions, I'm going to hand over to Chris now. <laughs> Uh, so my name is Chris, I'm one of the advisors in our Belfast office and I'm going to talk a little bit just now about the seven step process and what that, um, you know, what, what that should look like really. Um, so some of you may be familiar with this, uh, it is in the professional's guide, I'll come to the end as well. But um, there are seven steps to the overall, um, there are seven steps to the, um, you know, to the process of the, not only the assessment, but then also the support plan that you had mentioned earlier. So uh, the first step really is what is important to the person, okay? And that is very much uh, that that is very much the key difference between um, self direct support being introduced and traditional direct payments. It's about what it's about looking at what's important um, to the person as well as what's important for them. So uh, you can see in the graphic there, um, it kind of encourages the person to kind of you know, put down a little bit about who they are, their likes and dislikes, and, uh, you know, what kind of, um, you know, what their interests and, and aspirations are. Um, now, it, it's important to mention that at every step of the support planning process, the plan, uh, the support plan should be as specific and as individual as, as possible, okay? So uh, whenever you're doing a support plan with a servicer, it should be personalized as much as possible. So uh, the other wee thing then is uh, changes that the person wants to make. Um, so I'm going to talk about that a wee bit later on as well. But it, it, it's about kind of discussing, uh, you know, how the person's life is minute and changes they would like to make for the better. It has to be married up to. Um, it has to be married up to, to good personal outcomes. Okay. So it's about trying to make it specific to the person, just rather than a bit more, you know, rather than being quite general. Okay, so what that means, for example, is rather than saying that they would like to socialize more, which is a little bit general, um, you know, they, they, maybe need to, they maybe need to say a little bit more about specifically how they would like to do that. Okay, and then the, the third one you'll see there is how will you be supported? So that's a wee bit of the when, where, and who. And again, that is important just in saying, okay, taking into, taking into account a little bit of health and safety. Um, who will support you? When will they support you? And um, you know who will it be? It's also important to note as well, um, and the trust does kind of each of the trusts do kind of you know mention this in their uh, in their kind of support plan training. But it is important to note as well that some of the support being provided to somebody could be free as well as paid for. Um, so that's also something that we can help with in terms of. That's also something that we can help with in terms of. Uh, you know, helping someone to identify uh, free support. So um, what that means as well is just that they, they might come to us and we have an information officer at Austin who, uh, we have an information officer at Austin who um, will, you know, help, help them kind of identify organizations and things like that or other charities in their local area, which might also be of help. So um, the next wee step then, um, the next wee step then, number four there, as you'll see, is um, how they'll use their personal budget, okay? So uh, detailed costs. Now, um, you know, within the support plan, you're not expected to be an accountant and neither is a service either. 
Um, but the, you should basically see a wee bit there of a breakdown of how the money is going to be used. It doesn't have to be exact there and then, but at least get an idea of that. And the services can always come to the likes of ourselves, um, to the likes of CIL, for a wee bit of, um, you know, for a wee bit of guidance and a wee bit of number crunching if, if they need that kind of support. Um, the other we think is then how the how the support will be managed. Okay, so what that basically means is um, what that basically means is what will the services role in that support be? How will they? Um, you know, what are they looking at as to how it will be managed? Will they manage it as the employer? Will a friend or family member become the employer? Will they look at something entirely different? And will they simply use um, third parties? You know, either a third party agency. Will they use money for something entirely different? Okay, um, but how will they manage their support? And it's good as well. Uh, we'll come to it in a wee bit, but it's good as well to kind of think about how that's going to look on a regular basis. Okay. Um, the other, the next wee step then is about how they will stay in control, um, and that's about the the service user as much as possible making those important decisions um for themselves okay so it's about them staying in control um now they may get support uh they may get a lot of support from friends and family and from ourselves but it's very very important um that the services voice is always heard there and that the, the, the services voice um you know always stays at the forefront so that somebody else isn't always speaking for them without without that valuable input okay um, and then the next three steps, the final step really is just what, what's going to happen next to make that, uh, what's going to happen next to make the plan, you know, possible to make it actually, to get the ball rolling and such. And again, that's about having something a wee bit specific in that last step. It's not saying that the, um, it's not saying that the person has to have everything planned out perfectly, but what are they going to do to, you know, to get the ball rolling on, on their um, you know, on their support plan and on their on their support overall. So it's very important as well just to note that the um, the support plan that you do, and I'm going to talk about this in a, in a moment or two as well. But the support plan that you're going to do with the services, okay? It is a wee bit. I, I know that you do the assessment need first, and then you do the support plan traditionally. But obviously, there there should be a wee bit of overlap between those two as well because. Um, they're both going to evolve, and especially the support plan should be evolving. It should be, um, it should be getting reviewed on a you know six month or, or annual basis. Okay, so it should be an evolving document that um, that that's, you know always being looked at to make sure that things are uh, to make sure that things are on track. So um, also as well, just there is a wee bit of, so I know I've spoken a wee bit about it, um, just in terms of the seven step process. There is a lot more detail of that in the in the professional guide, okay? So you should have access to those um, in, in your offices as well. And if you don't, um, you should be able to speak to a colleague or, or manager. Um, and most of the trusts also have an implementation officer for self-trust support, which you can seek out as well. If you're really not sure, um, always feel free to give us a call. We offer just as much support to social workers and care managers um, and everybody else as much as we do to um, you know, trust services. Okay, so if, if you are stuck, feel free to give us a call as well. Okay, so um, just before, um, so just kind of to move on and before we go through some of the wee tools, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, thinking outside the box. So, um, so a, fr a friend of mine that I knew, um, a friend of mine that I knew, I still do know as well. But um, a, a friend of mine um, was a um, was kind of a, an amateur athlete uh, for quite a for quite a well known uh, sporting team. Um, they were in the they were in the development squad. Um, it's the kind of sporting team that would be on that would be on kind of major TV on Saturdays, that kind of thing. And they were in the development squad. They were um, they were a very keen athlete. They were very promising. Um, they unfortunately, very sadly, they had an accident um, while on the. They had an accident while on the field, and they, you know, they they they, they broke their neck, um, which left them, you know, paralyzed. Um, so really, just in terms of thinking outside the box, what I wanted to do now, um, if I can just scroll over, I just wanted to have. I just wanted to get a few of these to put a, a couple of wee things in the chat boxes. If you could think of anything that that. Things that you might consider with that person if they were a service user of, of yours. 
Okay, so this was a um, th this was a, a young lad. He was in his very kind of early twenties. As I say, he was a, he was a very promising athlete, a very promising amateur athlete in the um, in the development squad for a um, for a very well known sporting team. And he, he um, and as I say, he broke his neck, uh, became paralyzed. And I just want um, for for a few of these, maybe if you want to put a couple of wee things briefly in the chat box as to how you think would be best. To support him, what would be, what would be quite good to, um, what be, what would be quite good, to, you know, to kind of chat about with them in terms of the kind of support that they could do with. So if you want to drop a couple of wee things in the chat box, or even if you want to, if you can, if you've got your microphones turned on and you want to shout out, that would be, um, that would be pretty good as well. Um, Alison, if, if anything comes up in the chat, if you want to read out for me, or if, say, if anybody wants to shout out a couple of things. Does anybody have any kind of ideas as to what they might want to chat to the young lad about? Okay, we have one PA to support him to attend sporting events. Okay, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's good, that's good. Um, all right, is there any others? Expecting and dealing with feelings of frustration, anger and grief. Okay, yeah, that's very good, yeah. I would like to explore the options open to him to pursue his interest in sports specialist equipment. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so those those are all quite good. Um, those are all quite good. Those are actually pretty all um, on the mark, I would say. Um, so the reason we're kind of talking about this is a little bit about the difference between just um, you know between just getting somebody up in the morning um, and and kind of actually helping them to to live a very proactive life. Um, and that, that's very important. Um, that's very important to, to consider as well, um, because th that's kind of one of the key differences between traditional direct payments and self care support. It's about not only about helping someone to get up in the morning, but what they want to achieve, what their goals and aspirations are. So just um, just on, on that we uh, just on that we note, um, I say so, so this uh, this friend of mine, I say that uh, became paralyzed. They, um, they they got direct payments and they were able to put in place quite a few things. So obviously it was identified uh, within their support plan that health, fitness, and competition was very important to them. Okay, it was it was an integral part of their identity. Um, you know, so that that was that was very important to them. Uh, they wanted to minimise the impact of their disability as much as possible, and they wanted to stay an athlete. Okay, and um, just like it was said there in the chat box, that became. Um, you know, a key aspect of that is also for somebody's mental health as well as for their physical health. And that's just as important to consider. The impact of becoming paralyzed, um, you know, can lead to, you know, can lead to depression and, and other things, you know, and sports and a lot of, and keeping up things that, that people are passionate about is very, very important. So uh, for this young lad, minimizing the impact of the disability and staying an athlete was very important. Um, and so what they decided to do, amongst other things, not only did he have um, a traditional personal assistant that would help him with some day-to-day -day tasks, but he was also allowed to use he was also allowed to use the um, you know the, the direct payment toward um, a personal trainer uh, within the gym. Now it is important to note as well. I know that he didn't pay for the personal trainer every single time he went to the gym. Okay, because personal trainers are quite expensive, but he he was allowed to use the money to pay for to pay for a personal trainer. Um, so many times, you know, a month, and then he and his personal assistant would also work through, um, you know, his his trainer program as well. It, it is also worth noting there. I didn't put it up on the screen because I didn't want loads on the screen, but it's also also worth noting there that he was allowed to save up hours for sporting events and weekends away, so that his personal assistant could obviously provide that very vital support. Um, and it is worth noting that the um, you might say, okay, well. Was um, was a, a good use of public money? I would say it very much was because he has went on um, to become a Paralympian um, and he has played in numerous international events. Um, he's been to the Paralympics and he continues uh, to play at a very high level. Um, I know as well that that had a that that had an amazing impact. Um, you know, not only on on you know his his identity as a person that he was able to. Kind of not not only keep up his kind of competitive nature and his health and fitness and his athleticism, but he was able to excel at it and become, I'd say, a Paralympian. So what I'm just going to talk about um, briefly 
is just some of the tools that we um, that we often talk to people about when they first contact us. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them today because there are quite a lot. Okay, but I am going to talk about I am going to talk about the two that I personally, and I'm sure a lot of the other advisors would agree. I'm going to talk a little bit about the two that I think are the most impactful. Okay, the two that give you kind of you know the the best bang for your buck, as it were, in terms of they're quite simple, um, but they they really do help. So the first one is just simply what's working well and what's not working. And it's literally as simple as what you see on the screen. Um, I mean, we can provide you with templates and stuff like that, but it's so simple. You don't even need a template. You just get an A4 page, draw a big line down the middle, and what's working well on one side, what's not working well on the other. And <laughs> I know it seems incredibly simple, but it has such a great impact in terms of just getting it all down on the page, because people will often think about these things throughout, throughout their day, throughout their week. But whenever you start getting it down on the actual page, it allows people to see what needs to change and what is kind of okay staying the same, okay? So what's working well, what's not working well, literally just a line down a page um, and you, you kind of just start going, you know, as you think of them. We also do advise people, uh, we also do advise people um, of, of using these tools as well, not only at the support planning process, but we actually advise people, I know that I talk to people all the time about using these tools before you come out to do their assessment with them because it allows people to prepare rather than just kind of thinking, you know, there and then in the moment because people will forget things. So it's good, as I say, we, we would advise people to prepare with some of these. So the next wee one as well, again, quite simple, we got more involved in it, but not too much more work, is just in terms of getting someone to look at their perfect week. And again, that's just a very simple, we, we can provide templates, but again, it's just a very simple diagram that people can do it themselves. How they would like their week to, how they would like their week to look, morning, afternoons, and evenings, just Monday right through to Sunday. Now, we're not saying that everybody is going to be able to go to Barbados and have cocktails on the beach. But what we are saying is, how would you like your, how would you realistically like your week to be if you had all the support you needed to, to kind of lessen the impact of your health condition or your disability? What would you have in place for your perfect week to allow you to, to live the kind of life that, that you wanted to live? What, what we often advise people as well, I'll often say to people, not only about doing the outdoor perfect week, do their week as it is now and do their perfect week again so that they can compare and contrast the two. And that's a little bit, um, again, that's just a little bit so that they can, um, so a wee bit like the working, not working, they can kind of see the two side by side and that kind of helps them again for a little bit for the assessment. Um, all right. So um, what I just wanted to mention briefly was another wee example of thinking outside the box. Now we have plenty of these. I've tried to pick the. I've tried to pick a couple that have had the most impact. Um, so this was this was quite some years ago. A family contacted me because their young son um, their young son had um, has autism, and um, so he had um, he had behavioural needs as well as some physical therapy needs. And at present, he had been allocated a direct payment. I think it was about 35 to 40 pounds a week. Um, he had been allocated a direct payment to go horse riding, okay? A type of, um, you know, equine therapy as such. I used to do it years ago as, as well, whenever, um, I used to do it years ago as well, whenever I was a kid. So this young lad was allowed to use, um, this young lad was allowed to use his direct payments to go up to, um, to, to go to the Castle Well and Riding School. And that simply allowed him to go once a week to get a wee bit of horse riding. The, the animal therapy was quite good for him and calming him down, but it also provided physical therapy as well. Now, the family originally contacted us because their neighbour had half jokingly kind of said that they could, their neighbour had quite um, quite a large garden slash phase, and their neighbour had half jokingly kind of said that they could that they could keep the horse in their field. So the family contacted us just to, um, the family contacted us just the, the, the kind of mum and dad were like, okay, look, we just wanted to, to kind of check this out first. Would it be realistic for us to, um, you know, buy a pony if we were allowed to use the documents for the maintenance and the upkeep? Now, uh, so we chatted about that a little bit. We chatted about the, 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 the outcomes and what that would look like on paper. I then, we had a wee bit of a meeting with the social worker as well, so myself, the social worker, and the family, we chatted about it for a little bit, um, just to try and get it down in the support plan on paper in a realistic fashion. And it's very important to note that one of the one of the key things we were saying we weren't the family weren't asking the trust to, to buy them a pony. They were saying, look, if we buy a pony, can we use the same amount of money we get now for feed, for equipment, and for upkeep? 
And the main argument for that was really, uh, it was mainly about the cost benefit analysis. Instead of going horse riding once a week, the young lad was not able to go horse riding multiple times a week. It wasn't going to cost the trust any more money. Um, the draft payment didn't need to get any, any larger, but the young lad was getting a lot more benefit out of it. So that got approved. Um, the family got the, you know, got the fail, you know, got using the fail, got the cunning and stuff. And I, I haven't been in contact for, for a year or so, but I was in contact with them six months or so after. And it was all going very, very well. The young lad was able to go horse riding whenever he wanted, you know, three or four times a week instead of just once a week. And it was costing the trust no more money. So that's a wee bit about thinking outside the box and just kind of, if the family has a good idea or if you kind of think of something, kind of just go with it. I, I know that sometimes you'll be thinking, oh, will this get approved or will it not? But you never know. So go with it and, and kind of, you know, see what happens. Contact us if you need to have a wee bit of a think about it, uh, about putting the final paper and stuff. So one of the wee things I just want to talk about now is just in terms of some of the support that we do provide. Um, if if someone is thinking about employing a personal assistant, okay? So um, the first wee thing really is just recruitment, okay? So um, people will come to us for, for recruitment if they don't already have somebody in mind. Um, and we'll talk through with them the, you know, the, job, the job description, the personal specification, the advertising, the interviewing, and the terms and conditions. Uh, so we'll kind of talk them through all that. Now, it is important to note that we won't necessarily do the interviewing with them, okay, because it's very important that the employer themselves picks the, you know, the best candidate. We can't be held responsible for that. But we do, we do offer guidance on that, and we do also let, uh, we do also kind of offer our, you know, our boardrooms and our conference room for, um, for employers to do that, okay? So that's, that's a, a major aspect of some of the support that we provide. Um, one of the other things then um, that, we'll, that we'll go through with somebody as well is obviously their legal responsibilities in becoming an employer. So that would include their employer and public liability insurance, health and safety legislation, um, the terms and conditions of employment again. Uh, we'll also go through with them some HMRC rules and regulations. Now the payroll team will look after a lot of that for them if they're using our payroll service, pretty much most of it for them. Uh, but we do talk about that briefly as well, as well as workplace pension regulations which again is looked after by our payroll team if they're using that. But if someone's not using our payroll service, we will still have a set up meeting with them and we will still go through these things so they, they know it for themselves as well. So just very briefly, I'm not gonna go through everything here, but just to let you know that we do provide our employees with terms and conditions of employment. So that includes things like who the employer is, obviously their start date, their terms of employment, um, their period of employment, their job title, um, annual leave, holiday entitlements, uh, disciplinary grievance procedures, and other things like that. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. It's a 15, 16 page document usually. Um, but it's important to know that we do provide that for the employer, um, you know, so they, they do have that. So, the, the next wee thing, then, just last but not least, is I just want to talk a wee bit about uh, managing a PA's um, redundancy, okay? So I want just, if you want to put in the chat box what you think might be involved in that, and often if you can just read a couple of those out for me again. Um, if you just want to put a couple of the ideas in the chat box of what you think might be involved in uh, managing a redundancy or, or what that might look like. Okay, so just take a wee second or two and um, drop something in if you, if you think of something. Dana, just to, just to go back to where you just were. Do you have then standard templates for these, um, for all of those? Yes, for the terms and conditions of employment. Yes. Yes, yes, we do. We have, um, yes, we do. And what we do then is whenever we're discussing it with the employer, they will we'll let them know what areas of that they, they can customise and what areas um, what areas kind of have to stay the same, usually for, usually for legal reasons or something like that. Um, but yes, we do. We have standard templates. And we'll usually discuss those with the employer as well. We try our best not to send them out unsolicited. Well, not unsolicited. We try to send them out as best we can, you know, without not without kind of. We, we we try to make sure we have a conversation with the employer first, um, you know, so that they know what it is and so that they know what areas that they should be looking at. But yes, we do have standard templates for that. So um, before we move on, is there any ideas in the chat box, Alison, of the redundancy or no? They're yep. just waiting on you to tell them all. Okay. All right. So uh, there's a couple of wee things. Now, this is it quite, um, this is, it says up there a minimum of a three-step procedure because it is a minimum of that. And it does some, it does sometimes take a wee bit longer. 
it's just as good for you to know that as well as for the employer to know that because um, redundancy and closing a payroll and stuff can can be a wee bit stressful at times. So it's good to have um, you know kind of you know realistic expectations of that. So the first step then is just for the employer to put it in writing. Okay, so they need to let the employer know that they're being made redundant. They also then need to meet the discuss the issue. Okay, so they should have a face to face meeting with the uh, with the employee again, just to kind of talk through it. The employee does have a right of appeal technically. Now this would apply much more to much bigger employers in terms of okay, are there other other jobs available or anything like that for the employee, or can they work with stars? But again, even though it might not apply all the time, that that third step is there as well. Okay, um, it is. Um, it is very, very important to note that the that the that the employer should always, always contact the uh, their you know their insurance provider for legal advice. Okay, so that's very, very important. Um, and don't forget, as I say, that is a minimum of a three-step process. Sometimes it can be a wee bit more than that whenever there's a bit more back and forth. Okay. So um, the, the yeah. So as I say, they should also they they should always consult the twenty-four hour helpline. Okay, and uh, don't forget as well, it's very important just to note that the trust must consider then topping up the account to cover, you know, the associated costs with uh, making staff redundant. That's normally negotiated between the insurance company and the, you know, and like yourselves on behalf of the trust. So that can be a wee bit of a back and forth and stuff and we'll obviously facilitate that as well. So again, um, just before I pass over to Megan, it's just important to note that the employer should always contact their um, the legal relative the legal advice helpline of their insurance company. And there are three insurance companies within Northern Ireland. Those are Surewise, um, three insurance companies that offer the, an adequate level of coverage. So there's Surewise, there's Mark Bates Limited, and there is Fish. We tend to leave it up now to the employer to make their own to make their own decision on that, you know. So again, we'll talk about that with them. So now I'm just gonna pass over to Megan and I'm kind of hoping the controls will work for you, Megan, but um, over to you. Fingers crossed, Chris. Yeah, so bear with me and I'll just approve that. Okay, and hopefully that should be you, Megan, maybe. Super. So I have the task of talking about the not so exciting budgets and services. Initially, we were going to demonstrate how we do it, but um, we chatted and we decided it would be better if you all stayed conscious to the end of the presentation. So we decided to go another way. Um, Oh, Chris. Uh, wait, hey, maybe it worked. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting for us um, nerdy people that have tested this over and over again. So when we are looking at someone's budget, whether it's initially in setup or whether they have been set up already and they are a service user and their payroll is running either with us or someone else or by themselves, however they choose, we look at where's the money coming from and what the rules around using the money are. So whether it's a traditional DP rate, if people haven't moved over to SDS, whether it's the SDS rate, if it's ILF, if it's self-funding, and we try and figure out how we're going to make that work to achieve whatever is needed to be achieved. We have to always consider the administrative costs. So the cost of running a payroll with ourselves or someone else or payroll software, if you're gonna do it independently or whatever it's gonna to cost to cover that payroll, as well as your insurance. The different providers have different rates, different people need different levels of insurance. So those things have to be factored in. Who's gonna provide the care? Are you going to employ a personal assistant and cover the employer costs? Are you going to get a self-employed assistant and maybe have to provide for someone else coming in if they were off because the needs are still there and the needs have to be met. So we have to try and make sure that we have a provision for that. Or are you going to use an agency? As Dina said, they're all very different budgets. They're all very different processes, but we consider all of those things. And then the big one is additional expenses. What is in your support plan? What else is sitting there? Because we have to make sure that those are budgeted for within the hours that you've, award, you've been awarded at the rate that you've been awarded. And if there's anything else that 
you really need to achieve to figure out how much it will cost to self-fund that just to make this plan really, really work. So please, <laughs> $12.91 is not what the employees get in. We have a lot of people come back to us and there's a lot of confusion around the $12.91 that people think their employees are getting paid £12.91 an hour. Um, I'm tempted to ask if they're employing, but I don't. Um, it's just, it's not feasible. We have to meet all those needs, all those employer costs within the budget. So just to help manage expectations and understanding, if you guys could do us a huge favor, and when you were speaking to people about DP, just kind of touch on that there is more that needs to be done with this 12 and 91 just to keep, you know, the expectations realistic, that would be amazing. So, so when we're talking about employee expenses, we're talking thing, things like pension, national insurance, sick pay, and annual leave. Now, pension, you're auto-enrolled after three months. Yes, you can opt out. If you choose not to, the employer obviously needs to cover that. You would make your contribution and the employer would make theirs. National insurance and sick pay, if you wanna keep the figure of 120 pounds a week in your head, it's not a definite, but should someone not be in receipt, should the employee not be in receipt of any benefits and this is their only source of work, this is not their second job, at 120 pounds a week, you're going to start qualifying for statutory sick pay, you're going to start qualifying for paying tax, you're going to pay national insurance. And those are things that you have to keep in mind that you have to budget for. Annual leave um, is a contentious one at times. People come back to us and say, but my PA cannot take annual leave, I cannot have anybody else doing the work, but like Chris said, and I'm sure Dina will touch on it, this is there's a life cycle of a DP. It's going to end. And when it ends, people need to be paid what they're due. So annual leave has to be factored in. It's really, really important. And your employees are entitled to it. And sometimes people need a break. So we have to factor all of those things in. So just in case, <laughs> 1291 is not what your employee is going to be getting um, unless they're a really specialized employee or there is some circumstance. 1291 is not what your employee is getting. Please, guys, please tell everyone. <laughs> so from my experience, because what I predominantly do is budgets and surpluses. I see a lot of really simple budgets, huge budgets, tiny budgets. But whenever I ask people, what is in your support plan? What is agreed? Um, there is a lot of confusion. There is a lot of what can I, what can I go back to my social work for? Can I only use this for personal assistance? Can I? And I think that some work on our side, on your side, because I kind of look at this as a team effort, um, needs to be done so that we can try and overcome some of these things because like Chris's stories really highlighted, there is a huge difference to the outcomes that can be achieved. So I, I know just looking at budgets, I've never, I've never done a pony budget. I have never had a family that was kind of sitting in this area. Now, bear in mind, I've only been here for four or five months, but I've done a lot of budgets. And I just, I think the story of Chris's is so incredibly special because in effect, it was still costing 40 pounds a month. The trust has budgets. You have limited resources. You have so many people that need care there so many social workers working so incredibly hard to tick so many boxes. And honestly, I take my hat off to all of you. But this story was really special to me. 
because 40 pounds a week could have been four hours of support with a PA. But for this family and for the social worker working with the family and the team lead and really like looking at the problem and finding a creative solution could potentially change this wee boy's life for 40 pounds a week, which I think just shows how incredible this support can be and how flexible it can be and how beneficial it can be. And I think that's just really inspiring and hopefully we'll see a lot more of it going forward. So the other big issue, well, not issue, but the other big thing that I focus on is surpluses. So you would possibly be contacted by a trust finance department to go out and meet with someone who has built a surplus in their account to try and figure out what is going on. So there we look at the funding and the account balance, which has to be accurate. We can't work on approximations. We look at, well, I'll just keep clicking here. Um, the advanced payment retention. I find that a lot of service users forget that the first payment is a double payment and that money cannot be used. So sometimes we see deficits because people have forgotten that they have received an advance payment. We have to factor in all their expenses, everything that is coming up, um, whether it is a tax bill, whether it is insurance, annual leave, can annual leave be carried over? How are we going to deal with that? When is it coming up? And for those in predominantly the Western Trust and some in the Southeastern Trust now, we do see them across all the trusts, but the Western Trust is, is definitely the leader in the four-week payroll where you will have to deal with the 13th payment. You will have to have money in the account building up each month for when this 13th period occurs in the financial year. It's so important that people don't forget about that because if they do, they could be ringing you saying they don't have money to pay their personal assistance. And if you're taking the money, requesting a refund for the trust, it's also really important that people remember to calculate that in or again, they're gonna be, they're gonna be coming back to you asking for help. Um, this is kind of what we're looking at when we work out someone's surplus. We take into account what is in their bank account, what is their budget. We really, you know, really drive home. This is the amount of money that you are having to keep one side for your advance payment. Don't touch it. That is your zero. And all the other expenses, whether it's wages, standing orders, payroll costs. We always ask about planned activities with the trust, annual leave. Is carried over 13th payment cycles, insurance, extra costs, and only after we've taken all of those things into consideration can we advise someone what their surplus is. When we do have the surplus, my go-to would be, do you want to go back to your social work and see if there's anything in your support plan that the surplus funds could be used towards or you know, go back to your social worker if you have any planned activities coming up so that they can approve the additional hours. Um, go back to your social worker and ask, what are we doing with the annual leave? Because of COVID, we have a lot of people asking, can they pay out their annual leave from last year? And we will direct them back to, to you guys with calculations and fingers crossed, we can work together to find the best way to Make sure that these funds are going to where they could go and to achieve what we all want to achieve, which is the most supported person for the best possible outcome. So just in case 1291 is not what your employee will be getting, um, please help us with that, guys. It will make a huge, huge difference. Thank you so much. Okay. Dean, I'm going to try and give you control again, Jess.
Okay, let's let's try. Let's try it. Let's see if it works. I'm hovering around the screen, but nothing's happening. So it might well be. I need your help again, Chris. No, it's not not working. Yeah, that's you. Oh, right. Okay. So I think I've I've gone too far forward here. Do you want me to take you back? Yeah, yeah. It seems to be racing away here. If you can go back. Yeah. Give me three seconds. Dina, let the mouse go a second, Dina. Okay. Okay, there you go. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to keep, ask you to keep in, in control of the mouse there. There, Chris. Sorry about the, the technology, folks. Um, so we did rehearse yesterday and it went very well, but I don't have any controls visible on my screen at the moment. Anyway. So here we are, we're, we're, we're coming into land, as they say, um, and I suppose this is really, uh, I, I should have first of all asked actually, has anyone got any questions in relation to um, what Megan has just shared? Um, okay, so I don't think Hello, any... uh, sorry, Dana. Hi, Anne, lovely to hear Hello, you. Dana, how are you? No, <laughs> good, good. Uh, I have one wee question, just uh, it's because I have to go early now, I have to go and pick up my granddaughter, her car has broke down. But anyway, um, can, have they ever resolved the problem of, um, you know, um, the worker being able to give medication? I know that was at the regional level, you know, they, with the worker coming into your home, are they insured for giving medication? Certainly the insurance companies will, will cover that. Um, but I think it needs to be looked at on a case by case basis because we do know that it's happening, Anne. Um, mm -hmm. And indeed, some of the delegated nursing tasks are happening as well uh, mm -hmm. across the, the, the country. But it's very much on a case by case basis. So mm -hmm. the answer is yes, yes, it is happening. And yes, the insurance companies do provide uh, the, the insurance cover for it. So hopefully that. It's helps. just that a lot of carers will say to me, I would take direct payments, only the carer wouldn't be allowed to give medication. You know, for for people, um, you know, in, in my field of learning disability, who yeah. where maybe the, the person takes a lot of medication and, you know, yeah, def um, definitely worth having the conversation with the, the, the social worker on that because uh, we've certainly seen it to be achievable and, and it, it is happening, yeah. Okay, Dina, thank you. Okay, not at all. Lovely to hear from you, Anne. Okay, any other questions there before we, we, we move on? Um, nothing, okay. Um, well, look, uh, I suppose I say we're, this is really what we would love you you guys to, to take away from the, this webinar you know we've, we've sort of touched really just skimmed over the top of some of these subjects and we are available as I say to do bespoke um short training long training whatever you you what you guys will find useful we're here to to support you um both within group settings over zoom um or if you just have a specific query as, as chris mentioned earlier we're here to help you as well uh, uh you know to, to, to find your way as you hopefully become more and more adventurous with the, the support planning um so just just moving on there chris please to the next slide and just three points here that i wish to i wish to cover with you um it is so important and recently i was reading over the direct payment legislation and the guidance from the department of health and i'd read over it several times before but um recently when i read it i i really it really struck me how many times it referred to how important it was that the best person is identified to become the employer so for example i've my both my elderly parents use direct payments as do i um and i am the employer for both of them as well as myself um, because in their 80s they really don't want to be bothered with the hassle that comes with with being uh, an employer not that it's a huge thing but really they've got better things to do with with their time um, and so they they nominated me to be there the employer on their behalf um, so it is important whenever you um, are talking to someone about using direct payments that there is someone who is going to be able to, to, to take on the, the responsibilities. We're going to look at that. Um, 
and also reviewing the, the who might be available to help them. Um, so maybe they want to be the employer themselves, but they're going to need some assistance. And who is going to be there to help them with, with the responsibilities? Because it's not just about being set up as an employer. It's an ongoing story. It has a beginning, middle and end, which we'll, 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 we'll be briefly looking at. And also reviewing who the employer is as well. So let's just move on there, Chris, please. So, yep, if you just pop up the, the text or they're all of the text. So it is so important to choose the right person. Um, some people we know have difficulty with reading. Some people will have difficulty with the numbers and just keeping track of things. Um, so are, is the person going to need assistance with that? Um, and, and how will you organise that? Uh, or how will they organise that? That needs to be actually discussed. So often, I know as an advisor, I've sat down, there's maybe been two or three people in the room, and I said, so who's the employer? And they all look at each other. So they've actually got as far as meeting with us to be set up as an employer, but they don't know who's going to take on the role. Um, and then... I, take on board it's not just about the numbers it's also about the personality are they going to be able to fairly manage staff schedules so that they don't get disgruntled staff are they going to be able to to manage uh, disputes that that could arise um, and some of the difficulties that some employers may experience I have to say the vast majority sail through the this middle but and absolutely love the experience of being the the employer and um, having all that choice and control and the vast majority of people that we are in contact with would never actually return to traditional services because even though there are these responsibilities they, um, the, the, the opportunities that it creates for them far outweigh some of the difficulties that they encounter uh, through their, the, the lifetime of the, their role as an employer. Um, so will they, again, will they need support to manage their money once a budget is set? Some people are just not good with managing money at all and so look it might be worth looking at how other how, how is this money going to be managed um we one thing that i can say that's actually not my notes but i do know it's in our recent uh, recently published uh, newsletter is that we do have a um, managed accounts service that we are launching so again if some people need some additional support there is an additional cost to that it would be attached to our payroll service but it is an enhanced version of the payroll service so if someone did need that that's worth maybe giving us a call um, uh, so that people don't uh, they, it doesn't they don't uh, overspend um, but many people will manage as long as they have someone else uh, if, if they need some support they have someone else alongside them who can help keep an eye on it or indeed yourselves whenever you go out that you just look and see has there been any expenditure there that looks a bit odd or payments that have gone out that you would never have expected to see in it so don't don't leave all that work to the monitoring team um, I know that the monitoring teams are quite small in all the trusts um, so and also you you as uh, whenever you're doing your reviews could catch things before um, uh, costs escalate for the service user if you can spot maybe a payment that uh, that has that has going out, out of that account that shouldn't be going out so just you, it would be worth helping them with that so on on to the next slide please Chris So yeah, event just who is available to help? Is it is it yourself? Um, I know that many social workers over the years have been really, really supportive of service users. Um, you know, they've familiarized themselves with what with all that what's what's involved and uh, are are absolutely great at just flagging up and referring people on just at various points just to get a few things checked out if they think something doesn't something doesn't look right. Um and um yeah, or and in some cases, trusts have actually given the person a little bit, maybe an extra hour a month, so that someone else can spend a bit of time helping them with their paperwork, um, making sure that everything is, is in order and, and kept tidy. Okay, moving on, please, Chris. Reviewing the employer. This is something that, again, just over time, because we've been around for 20 years now, um, you know, some some people maybe whenever they took on the role of being the employer had a lot of capacity, um, but maybe over time their health has deteriorated, they've become more frail, and uh, and they may need support now that maybe they didn't need in the past. 
past. So please keep that in mind because we have seen that um, as uh, years have gone on that people maybe have, have, have started to experience more difficulties because there have been more over over the years there has been more and more required of PA employers uh, to be compliant with the law and also to be compliant with, with trust re requirements as well. So again just whenever you're carrying out reviews just, just uh, consider that um, they say they could have a long-term disability or illness which is which is just you know becoming making life that more a bit more difficult for them to meet their employer responsibilities and of course there could be someone who maybe took on the role um, of being the employer when they're young free and single and now with lots of time on their hands and now they could uh, by this stage many years on could have a huge family to to, to care for lots of you know a career that that, that, that has taken off lots of other things could have come in um, that have uh, that, that now you into their time so are they still the best person to be the employer are they managing to stay on on top of things um so again it's always worth checking is this person still the best because we can it's very straightforward to transfer someone from uh the employer's responsibilities from one person to another um and we can certainly um help people through that process okay next slide please chris yeah so you know, keeping yourself, um, just keep in mind that DPs, uh, being a PA employer, there is, a, a, it is a life cycle. Um, there is the recruit, recruitment and all that goes with the um, getting set up as a new employer. Then there's all of those employers' responsibilities that need to be kept on top of um, as, uh, as, as the years hopefully roll by and um, people are benefiting from all the opportunities that using direct payments gives. Um, but there is, see, there's an, an employment law changes, HMRC rules change, pension rules change, all sorts of things can change over the years and employers need to be sure that they are compliant so it's a, it's about them keeping in touch uh, with ourselves and we certainly do our best to keep in touch with our service users keeping them informed of any changes that they need to be made aware of and then there's the the closure of a payroll which is usually quite a sad time maybe someone has moved into permanent residential care or the service user has passed away and as Chris has touched on that actually can be quite a lengthy process there's lots of work that employers need to do or if the service user was the employer what their their next of kin often has to has to do at a very difficult time it is all there, there is quite a, a lot of administration required and depending on lots of it, it, lots of things like if, if the direct payment um um, uh, is being held by the the bank and and as a, as an asset and has to go to probate. There's all sorts of things that can delay that full closure process, and your involvement in that um, is is often is often needed. Um, so you will be getting calls from service users on ourselves just about how you can help with with uh, particular aspects of that. Again, we can do a full session for anyone who's interested in knowing more about what's involved in, in closing down a payroll. Um, as I say, very, very few would be closing because they no longer want to use direct payments if they want to return to traditional care. We do have a few of those, but the vast majority are usually those who are in quite sad circumstances um, and have that responsibility. So just moving on there, Chris, please. Oh, sorry, we've been a you're okay you're all right yeah again another thing that you can do is to put things in writing i know it's it's easy just to um say give information over the phone or face to face with service users but you know quite often like yourselves they have incredibly busy and challenging lives as well and having things down in writing really I can't stress enough how important that is for service users we talk to service users day and daily who are actually quite unclear about what it is that they're being offered and in the legislation it's, it is very it is very very clear that trusts should be putting uh, any um, offers in writing um, you know that the, again explaining to people in writing when the money is likely to go into their account what period that money is to cover all of that sort of thing is, is really important for service users to know 
otherwise how can they plan? How do they really know what they've got? Unfortunately, we, we've met too many service users who think they've been offered maybe 15 hours a week and then we've, they've budgeted and made plans and recruited someone for 15 hours a week. But when it actually comes through and it, it comes through as 12 hours or the, the start date, there was confusion over the start date as well. Um, so again, the direct payments can change over the years, the amounts that people are getting. So again, making it clear um, to, to people when the, those rates do change uh, as well is so important rather than getting people to rely on, on, on looking at what's going into their, their account. Um, the, um, again, trusts quite often uh, can change their requirements in terms of monitoring and what they, they would want to see. So again, letting people know well in advance that there's going to be a change in what is expected of them in terms of what they would re respond uh, pass back to the trusts. Okay, thank you, Chris. Just on to the, the last slide. So it's a wee summary. So again, I would just um, love you to take this away um, with you um, as a summary, you know, please, you know, the, the support planning is, is such an essential part of SDS. It really does put um, the person in receipt of services in the driving seat. It doesn't be, have to be a very big, complex plan. Um, it can be very simple. Um, it really does depend on that, that service user. Um, and uh, but but and reviewing the plan as well because people's lives change um, and how they how we all want to live changes over time so that that does need to be reviewed choosing the right employer I've, I've, I've just stressed how it is a, there are responsibilities and it is important that the person taking on that responsibility is able to manage them be mindful of the life cycle, as I've just outlined there, of a direct payment. That there is, I, um, I know at the start, there was lots and lots of training um, within trusts about setting up a direct payment, trust uh, policies, procedures, paperwork within your trust, what the role of the employer is. But I, I actually haven't seen the training yet being rolled out on what's involved in closing a direct payment, what's required of the service user and what they need to what is uh, is asked of of them and how you can support them through that and as say finally keep it please keep the information flowing um please put things in writing um it is so so important because it, it just enables everyone to be on the same page um and uh you know so that the, the plans aren't put in place that, that are unachievable I'm just very conscious of the time, but um, we do have questions and answers now. Um, Alison, I'm going to hand back to you um, I, uh, for the Q&A section, if that's okay. We're, we're, we're here. And as I say, don't forget, you can book us. It's free of charge if you want us to come along um, to any of your teams to, to give more information. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm just looking at the chat here to see if there's any questions coming through. Um, if you don't want to type something into the chat, feel free to unmute and ask the guys some questions if you have anything um, before we go. Or you can email us afterwards and we can certainly forward the questions on to Dana and Chris and Megan and they can contact you directly if you have any, anything you want to know about. Hi, could I ask a question just about, I'm having quite a few queries at the moment about if somebody requires assistance of two personal assistants, you know, for personal care and stuff, um, and they're unable to get an agency, um, so they're having to resort to quite an expensive agency, um, can a family member act as a second carer, but still be allowed the budget for assistance of two? No. Do you want me to answer that? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, if I don't mind being here. Yeah, yeah. Um, if yeah, if the family carer has received the um, appropriate uh, training, um, I'm assuming that you're you're thinking of moving, um, moving people around using hoist that sort of thing. Is that correct? It probably. Well, I'm not quite sure of the exact uh, requirements or their needs, but I anticipate that that would be one of the things. So they'd have to have their manual handling and stuff like that. 
Yes, if they're working with another person, um, you know, I, I know that families um do a lot of moving um around and using house etc at home uh with, with loved ones, and and that's obviously their their right to do that. But certainly, if they're working with a personal assistant, a paid worker, um, they need to be trained in the same way as they they trained uh, as the, the the personal assistant they need to be using the, okay. the, the same systems. So the budget that they have been allocated for the assistance of two, that doesn't have to be reduced because the loved one or the next of kin is actually the second personal assistant, if you know what I mean? No, no not 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 necessarily. Um, again, okay. it's one it's one of those things that uh, you know, whenever someone gets a personal budget, it is based on the usually it's it's calculated based on the number of hours that someone requires support. And as I said to uh, Mervyn earlier, if if it's by two, then that's multiplied by two. Um, it is worth mentioning that quite often um, when someone requires um, uh, moving around, if, especially if you're talking about split shifts, um, where um, throughout the day uh, and somebody 20 minutes half an hour it's going to be very very difficult to recruit someone to come to work for a half an hour several you know several times a day so often that that um additional money would be put into um making that the 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 hours up to making the shifts worthwhile turning up for yeah. it's very hard to attract staff you know so so yeah quite often it is it is needed in order to even attract staff to be able to fulfill those sorts of roles um but of course it, it will also if the family member is providing the support um you know <laughs> That additional support can can also go towards um, other tasks that may often be left to that family member to do. So it can take some of the additional pressure off them. Yeah, thank you, Tina. That's what I had already advised to the practitioners, but thank you. I just wanted confirmation of that. No problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Very quiet bunch today, Dana. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure there's there, they'll go away and have plenty of questions later. But that's well, fine. Say, they're more than welcome. You can email us and we can forward them, or you can email Dana and the gang directly. Well, if there's nothing else, I suppose. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for attending, and thank you to Chris, Megan, and Dana for this morning. I think it was a very informative session.